Most people come to this meeting thinking that they're coming because they want to talk and listen to the doctors. That's very important, but just as important as learning from each other and learning from WM, other fellow WM patients. And we've got a great opportunity now to learn from Neil Massif. We, we, I talked about him before, so I'm just going to bring him up, and uh, he'll give you the patient perspective. Thank you. Good morning, all, particularly the uh, newly diagnosed. It's wonderful to have you here. My first patient forum, I think we had about 60 or 70 people, and we hoped to someday hit 100. We did that about 16 years ago or so, and it's wonderful to see this turnout. Um, there are as many patient perspectives as there are diagnosed patients. There clearly is not one way we will react. But I'll talk about some of the more common reactions. I'll tell you a little bit about my own journey and my reactions at various points. Um, welcome to my birthday party. It was 20 years ago this week that I visited my primary care physician. Uh, I had extreme fatigue, a chronic cough, leg cramps, night sweats, uh, weight loss, quite a bit of weight loss. Um, and although I didn't realize it at the time, the neuropathy that I had in my foot for a couple of years was not due to racquetball, but rather due to the Waldenstroms. Twenty years ago was a different century, literally and figuratively. It was prior to the talk list. Um, Rituxin was just being discussed, just very, very, very new on the market. Uh, so it was a different time. Um, you couldn't turn to the talk list, which many people do rather quickly now. But the reactions were pretty much the same. Most people then and now feel kind of overwhelmed. This is not a form of cancer that's familiar to us. Uh, we all know people who have had a list of the usual cancers. We either know people personally or know someone who knows someone. And with Waldenstrom's, I think most of us were hit with something that no one had heard of, which leaves us kind of overwhelmed and um, confused, bewildered. The uncertainty of it all uh, makes for a lot of anxiety. Um, frequently, people um, talk about the anxiety. I'm a psychologist, and psychologists make much of the anxiety and depression. I don't find the depression to be as prominent as most people report. The anxiety is there, a lot of when do you do treatment, et cetera. Of course, when I'm saying I don't find depression as much, my sample is limited to you folks, the people who come to patient forums, and the, pe and the people who come to support groups. The people who do not reach out and ask for help, the people who are home, might be more depressed. We don't know a lot, a lot about the group that we don't see. Um, a recent uh, posting on the talk list uh, mentioned that one of the major treatment centers has hired a psychiatrist to uh, work with the people who are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder following diagnosis. That's not with Waldenstrom's. I think it was uh, more general. Um, the study reported that of 205 people in the study, 20% suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder six months following diagnosis. I have to caution you, though. The study was done in Malaysia. We don't know much about the support in Malaysia. And it was not Waldenstrom's. It was a mixed group of patients. And other forms of cancer uh, have shorter longevity, more toxic treatments, a greater need for surgery. We're fortunate that we're not facing uh, the worst of the treatments. And so we may not have that incidence of post-traumatic stress disorder. The anxiety can cause concentration difficulties, and concentration difficulties can cause memory uh, difficulties. And the, quotes chemo brain you sometimes hear about could be a result of treatment, it could be a result of anxiety, it could be both. So what happens when we're diagnosed? Uh, with feeling overwhelmed, people usually feel, I have to start becoming educated. Um, there's a lot to be learned. Some of the brochures that are outside on the table and the other 
uh, brochures published by IWMF that tell us about the biochemistry and treatment options, et cetera, can be quite helpful. You're going to need to read them more than once. They're very helpful, but there's a lot that we need to learn. Uh, for the newly diagnosed, you will be impressed with the in-depth questions uh, that some of the old timers particularly uh, ask following the presentations. You'll become very knowledgeable as well. And one thing I would advise is to never ever hesitate to ask a question. The same is true when visiting your oncologist, hematologist. They're a wealth of information and you'll feel overwhelmed with some of the information they're providing and don't hesitate to ask them questions either. And I'd encourage you to ask some of what I call the process questions, not just what treatment should I do now, but how do I go about making a decision about, because we need help with that kind of decision making process. So what do you do after you're diagnosed? One of the first things that I think most of us face is should we go public or keep this quiet? Um, and there are people who keep it quiet and there are people who go public. Uh, there are people who need to not be too open because of some related occupational issues. Um, I was fortunate, nothing was gonna limit my uh, being public. And it's also my style. I tend to be a pretty open guy. My wife's an open person. Um, and I told my friends and told relatives, and I found that to be helpful. Uh, there is a drawback, though. When people know about your cancer, you tend to be labeled and identified as, quotes, a cancer patient. And not wanting to be labeled as a cancer patient is not necessarily a bad thing. So it's a personal choice that you have to make. Another initial reaction is to want to, quotes, do something. Um, we have one member of the New York City support group who reports that when he was diagnosed, he felt that, well, at least I have a cherished sweater collection and I want to decide who's going to get my sweaters when I die in the near future. And he gave away his sweaters to his friends and now almost 20 years later, he's still trying to get the sweaters back. Um, most quick impulsive decisions are not necessarily good. Uh, but they can be. Many people will decide quickly, I'm going to change my diet, and usually the dietary changes are for the better. Uh, I know of one gentleman who purchased a motorcycle, which was good for him, but not necessarily for the marriage. Um, with my initial reaction, I thought, okay, what can I do? I can't change diet. We eat a, quite a healthy diet. Uh, I don't smoke. I drink very, very moderately. Uh, so I gave up the multivitamin I was taking because I couldn't. Uh, 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 if my wife were here, she'd say, yes, he did. Um, by the way, my wife is usually here with me and sends her regards to the uh, old timer. She has another obligation, but uh, this is my 18th forum. Uh, uh, so, but I did one other thing. I had, just before being diagnosed, accepted a year-long professional association responsibility that was going to take considerable time. Um, I'm somebody who was very symptomatic and needed treatment rather immediately, and I decided with being diagnosed with having cancer that I was not Superman, I was vulnerable, and I thought, am I going to be able to give this responsibility the time that it deserves and also give the treatment the time that it deserved? And I decided after a few weeks of deliberation to resign from the professional responsibility, which was a very difficult decision, but it was a wise one. Uh, 20 years ago, we had fewer options. I was fortunate in that I live in North Jersey, you know, five miles from New York City, and there was a New York City support group. At that point, there were seven or eight support groups. There are now 55 or thereabouts in the U.S. and another 20 of foreign uh, support groups. The support group proved to be one of the two most accurate sources of information. The other one was attending patient forums. When I was first diagnosed, a cousin, who's a nurse researcher at a hospital, researched Waldenstrom's, made a copy for me of a chapter, and she said, this is the most authoritative source of information about Waldenstrom's. 
and that authoritative chapter said that I would live four years, uh, which was not too encouraging. I then came to a patient forum. I met quite a few people running around who had the disease for more than four years, and none of them appeared to be dead. Um, <laughs> and so I became a forum junkie and keep on uh, returning. Um, for me, knowledge is power. I've always felt that, and so seeking out knowledge is something um, that I felt I needed to do. Uh, and that's why I became a forum regular and a support group uh, regular. Um, I, I said I'll do a really quick little synopsis of my treatment. Uh, there are people here who have been on watch and wait for close to 20 years. Uh, not everybody needs treatment immediately. Not everybody needs treatment for many years. But I, I did. I, the rather profound fatigue uh, was the most debilitating thing that frequently necessitated treatment. Immediately after diagnosis, I had two CDA, then I had Lucaran. Both had very minimal uh, effects uh, that were very short-lived. I was essentially a treatment failure. Uh, my local oncologist at that point said, we need a second opinion. Go up to Dana-Farber and see the people there. He's a Harvard Med School graduate and sends people anywhere to Dana-Farber. That's his bias. And let me say at this point, I'll mention Dana-Farber several times. It's where I'm now in a clinical trial. It is a wonderful institution with wonderful oncologists. It's not the only one. This disease is blessed with having very, very, very fine researchers who are experts um, in the field, and they exist all over the United States. I'm not selling Dana-Farber. Uh, uh, I see consulting with an expert not as just gaining a little bit more information. I see it as just good common sense. It was Dana Farber that recommended that I try Rituxan, and I had Rituxan, I think, in 1999, 2001, 2003, and my pattern over the 20 years has been I usually have about 18 months of great health following treatment, then my IgM starts to go up and my hemoglobin starts to drop, uh, and at that point I need another form of treatment. And so I had the two treatments I uh, mentioned, plus three rounds of rituxan, um, and then at some point I uh, had bendamustine, I had a couple of rounds of Velcade, um, and then Brutinib. And with all of them, I had a very significant positive effect, but after about 18 months, I tend to build up resistance um, to what I've been profiting from and need something else. In September of 2016, I began a clinical trial with Venetoclax. Um, it's been wonderful. I love being able to pop pills rather than sitting around being infused for hours. Um, and I've had a, I started out with a IgM at about 4,600. It's now 1,500 and change. My, I think I was 9.1 or something in terms of hemoglobin. I'm now in the upper 12s. Um, I've had a drop in white blood count and neutrophils, but my brain did not read the textbook and I'm not smart enough to get sick, even though I have compromised autoimmune functioning. I've never been healthier. I haven't had a cold or a sniffle or anything. I was around grandchildren who came down with the flu the next day. So my white blood count's low, but I'm fine. Uh, and I'm a proponent of venetoclax, and I hope that ends up being an approved treatment. Um, no two of us are alike. We all respond differently. We all have different symptoms. There's one thing that's common to all Waldenstrom's patients, patients, and that is that we all hate bone marrow biopsies. Um, aside from that, there are no commonalities. Um, how do we cope? Uh, coping with anything is important, and coping tends to be divided into two areas, problem-focused coping and emotion-focused coping. I mentioned that my main coping technique is to gather information. That's problem-focused, but it's not really, because when we get information, it gives us hope, and the hope clearly um, is uh, a part of emotion-focused uh, 
uh, aspects. Support groups are clearly a combination of problem-focused and support uh, and uh, uh, problem-focused and emotion-focused. It's important to have a sense of control. That's an important part of coping, and many people uh, like keeping their own records, spreadsheets of dates and CBCs, et cetera, a very good coping technique. Um, in the emotion-focused area, it's important for life to have meaning for all of us. Um, some people have a tendency to make the cancer too much of the focus of uh, their life. And that doesn't really uh, help. We, one of the stories, if you look at the IWMF website, there are stories written by patients. And one of the stories that's currently on the list, the writer refers to WM as a hobby. An interesting conception of it. Um, and, but I think it's positive in that it's not an obsession. You don't want to become obsessed with it and make this a focus of all that you do. Um, you need to kind of reformulate, that's kind of a, a cognitive technique, uh, what it means to have WM. I mean, everybody thought, you know, gosh, if you have cancer, that's terrible. It bothers me that every time you read an obituary in the paper um, of a cancer patient, they talk about the battle with cancer. Everybody's out doing a battle with this enemy. Um, I don't suffer. I don't battle. Um, it's there, it's something that you do. Um, it's kind of like the next door neighbor who has loud parties too late at night. Um, I find that being more annoying, particularly since the woman next door thinks she has a great voice and sings into a microphone at her parties. Um, the cancer is not that bad as... Uh, <laughs> As the, you know, and it's problematic because she's a very sweet person. She really is very nice, and you know, it's, you can't really say to her, "You have a disgusting voice." But, <laughs> um, but you know, you fo fo do what you need to do. Don't ask yourself, "Why me?" You won't get an answer. Although I suppose I should not say that anymore because Dr. Mattis this morning gave us the answer. It's bad luck. But other than that, to try to find the cause, what did I do, what should I have done, uh, will not get you anywhere. Um, we had a new support group member who came in one day, who was determined to find out what's the commonality in this room. Something is causing it. And wanted to know what everyone did. There were about 20 patients there at the time, and I think five of us happened to be academics. We were teachers. And she said, what in academia could cause cancer? <laughs> and I said, I know the answer to that one. I always said that boring faculty meetings were toxic. <laughs> so, um, For those in relationships, I don't think anything was more important than doing cancer together. About two or three weeks, as I recall, after I was diagnosed, I was bemoaning the fact that I have cancer. And I said that to my wife, and she said to me, you don't have cancer, we do. And I said, what are you talking about? That's not exactly what I said. I said, what are you talking about? With a few expletives thrown in. <laughs> uh, and she said, we raise kids together, we travel together, we take care of the house together, and we will do this together. And so we have. She's always, this is the first forum she's missed. Um, and she's always at all the medical appointments with me, and uh, it makes it an awful lot easier to not be doing it alone. Um, you need to look at what do I need to do personally? What would help you have more meaning in life? I need to relax, I need to have more fun, I need more time with my spouse, I need to entertain more or I need to entertain less. Um, I need to find a hobby, I need to travel more, I need to get involved politically. That may be a good one because then the cancer will seem very minor. Um, but what worked for you before? Um, in the beginning, I felt the need to do something uh, for IWMF. I really felt that with Rituxin is really what saved me. and. Uh, IWMF was just in the beginning of supporting research. We don't have national fundraising events for this form of cancer. 
Um, and so I became involved on the board, and I ran the fundraiser. I wrote to every friend and relative, and some who weren't quite close friends, and I was doing a fundraising event. Um, it was something I felt the need to do. We need to support the research. We still do. It's research is the reason we're all here uh, and not home and incapacitated. Uh, and so I did this fundraising event. I promised my friends that uh, this is a one-time deal, that I would never, ever again ask them for money. At that point, the life expectancy was up from four years to about five to seven. I didn't expect to be around 20 years later, and I regret promising them that I would not ask them again because I really would like to at this point. Um, doing fundraising, supporting research represents hope, and hope is what keeps us uh, functioning well. For many, prayer is an important part of hope. When I was first diagnosed, my son was married, had one grandchild, and leaving the oncologist's office the day of diagnosis, I said to my wife, I hope to be alive long enough to see our daughter be married. Uh, at the moment, she was not, at that moment, she was not dating anyone seriously. She's now married, has two children, and now have five grandchildren ranging in age from 11 to 21. All of them know about the diagnosis and uh, are kind of involved with things, and um, that all is very helpful. Try to reduce the stressors, but recognize that we do not have control over many people and many situations. Um, and again, you need the support from your family, from your significant other. Um, by the way, a meeting not long ago when people were introducing themselves, the men who were patients said, hi, I'm John and I'm a patient. And John's wife would say, I'm Jane, John's caretaker, caregiver. Um, and if the woman was the patient, she tended to say, I'm Jane and I'm a patient. And her husband said, hi, I'm Jane's husband. So a little bit different perspective. Men sometimes make the mistake of trying to do it alone. You have to protect the little woman. Guys, it won't work. You know, give up on that. Um, one final coping technique suggestion, avoid toxic people as much as you can and try to surround yourself with life-affirming people. Um, I promise you that nowhere will you meet a more supportive group of life-affirming people than you will at the patient forums. Thank you for your attention. We, we have to vacate the room in four minutes, but if there are any quick comments or questions, we have a couple of minutes. Go ahead, someone in my I just have a quick comment for you. When you said we need our spouse, my husband's been ill for 18 years, and he finally recognized how wonderful I am. He gave me, <laughs> he gave me a plant on Mother's Day. You know, let me say something. I think that's not an unusual feeling. We guys go through life I won't say feeling as though we can do everything ourselves. We know that we could do everything ourselves. And then you get hit between the eyes with a diagnosis with cancer, and boy, does it make a difference. And we are sometimes, I'm sorry to be negative about guys, but uh, you know, I work a lot uh, as a psychologist with men in stress disorders, and we feel we can do it alone. We're embarrassed to ask questions. I don't want somebody to know that I don't know that. And we rely upon women to do uh, a lot for us. And it's very healthy for the marriage. Is there another question? Yes, I, I want to reiterate the avoid toxic people. And that includes a doctor who doesn't <laughs> talk to you or answer your questions. Well. Yeah, walk. Um, my husband um, was referred to the top hematology group at George Washington University, where our presidents are taken care of in emergencies. And um, 
of course, at your first visit, you want to know your prognosis. So at every single visit, he drove the hammer home with, you got four years. So we walked across the parking lot to his internist, and he said, you know that bell curve? Well, you're an outlier, and you folks are outliers. And if you have someone who you just don't get along with, or you don't understand why they want to start treatment, walk find someone else. And mm -hmm. your talk was wonderful. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I think there's a, we, we all need to find resources. And there are certainly many wonderful physicians who will talk to us. And the other thing I have to say is sometimes we have our own style. And sometimes a physician, because I've seen this happen with people with support groups, where someone will say, oh, Dr. So-and-so is terrible. And other people say, God. You know, I'm alive thanks to him, he's wonderful. Sometimes physicians just tend to give lots and lots of information, and one person just thrives on that, and someone else feels like they're being lectured at. So I think we also need to find the person that works for us. That's very important. Um, you know, no one should be seeing somebody for something like cancer treatment and not feel comfortable. Uh, just a comment, I'm, I'm newly diagnosed in November, and and you talked about The Hobbit and other. Um, I was struck by the description of this as indolent better, smoldering. So when I picture my WM, I picture her in a red velvet gown on a chaise lounge <laughs> with a cigarette holder in one hand and a martini in the other. <laughs> On that, it's time for us to stop. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you, Neil.